Now we've found out how to quantize an electromagnetic field mode, and we've set up the kinds of operators that will help us handle this quantum mechanics. With these tools, we can look in more detail at the quantum mechanical states of the electromagnetic field. Many states are possible quantum mechanically for the electromagnetic mode. Nearly all of these are quite different from the fields we're used to classically. Particularly important examples, which we're going to discuss, include number states and the coherent state. Of these various possible quantum mechanical states of an electromagnetic mode, only the coherent state has much relation to the fields we expect in a mode from a classical analysis. It is essentially the kind of field generated by a laser and corresponds quite closely to our classical notion of an electromagnetic field in a mode. Several quite non-classical states can be created in the laboratory at least, such as so-called squeeze states and photon anti-bunched states. These other possible states are in practice quite difficult to generate controllably, often requiring quite sophisticated nonlinear optical techniques, but they do verify the quantum behaviours possible with light. We'll start here by looking at number states, which are the states with specific numbers of photons in a given mode. The Hamiltonian and the number operator have eigenstates, which we can call n lambda in this ket format here. And those, of course, correspond to n lambda photons in the mode lambda. And these are known as number states. They're also known as Fock states. In these states, the probability of measuring any particular amplitude, b lambda for the y component here, b lambda y, in this mode, is distributed according to the square of the Hermit Gaussian harmonic oscillator solutions with that quantum number n lambda. These are the wave functions we worked out before when we were looking at the harmonic oscillator, and the mathematical form remains the same in our present case for this quantum number n lambda. And the amplitudes of the electric field, E lambda in the z component here, E lambda z, those are distributed in a similar kind of a way, based on the same functions. Now, if we ask for the expectation values of the amplitudes of these modes, either the electric or the magnetic amplitudes, we will find that those are both zero for any number state. So let's look at this here. Formally, we want to find the expectation value of the electric field in the z direction, the amplitude at least of that mode. So we know we're in state n lambda, that is n photons in mode lambda. So we formally evaluate the expectation value using the operator for the electric field amplitude in this mode. Well, when we do that, of course, we have some function out front that gives the shape of the mode and other constants associated with the amplitude. But the core operator part of the electric field operator is this pair of operators here. The creation operator in mode lambda minus the annihilation operator in mode lambda. We've established all our relations for what should happen when these operators operate on number states. So let's see what happens here. For example, if we take the annihilation operator and operate on the state n lambda, then we'll get the state n lambda minus 1, that is one less photon in the mode, and we will have a square root of n lambda out front. If we take the creation operator and operate on the state with n lambda photons in mode lambda, we'll get the state n lambda plus 1, that's one more photon in the mode, and we'll have a square root of n lambda plus 1 out front. But this simply equals 0. Because these states, n lambda, n lambda minus 1, and n lambda plus 1, are all eigenstates of the same Hamiltonian, and they're all orthogonal. So these inner products here, between, for example, the state n lambda and the state n lambda minus 1, they evaluate to 0. And the same thing happens for this inner product. So the net result is both of these terms are 0, 
So the answer for this expectation value is 0. And we get a similar result if we take the magnetic field mode amplitude, which would involve the sum of these operators in here. We might think it very odd that there may be energy in this mode, but yet there appears to be no field. It's not, however, correct to say that there's no field in the mode. It's just that the average value of the amplitude is zero. This strange behaviour can be explained if we presume that the phase of the field is quite undetermined in such a number state. Any given measurement is quite likely to result in a finite amplitude for the electric or magnetic field in the mode, but because of the possibility of the amplitude being positive or negative, or even somewhere in between, the average is zero. These number states, while simple mathematically, bear little relation to classical fields. Despite that, we keep them, at least formally, because they are useful mathematically as a way of writing quantum mechanical states. And of course, they are also the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian for the mode. Now, so far we've been using solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the electromagnetic mode. And we are going to use the term Schrodinger equation here in a rather generalized sense, where we mean that we simply have some operator equation, an eigen equation, where we have a Hamiltonian operating on a state is equal to an eigenvalue, an eigenenergy here, E, times that state. This we will regard as a Schrodinger equation, regardless of precisely what the form of this Hamiltonian is. So that's a Schrodinger equation for a system in an eigenstate, phi, with an eigenenergy, E. Explicitly, for the eigenstates of our electromagnetic mode, we have that H operating on one of these number states here, this is the one with n lambda photons in the mode, gives us n lambda plus a half times h bar omega lambda, that's the eigenenergy, times this same number state here. That we would regard as a Schrodinger equation in the general way of looking at these equations. We can generalize our earlier postulations here and also postulate that the time-dependent generalized version of the Schrodinger equation is also valid. That is, an equation like this, even when we may be dealing with a rather different Hamiltonian from the kind of one that we had in our original Schrodinger equation for an electron. So again, it would be the Hamiltonian operator operating on the state phi, as usual, i h bar d by dt of the state phi. And this, as I said, will hold true even if our Hamiltonian is not the one in our original Schrodinger equation for an electron. This would be our generalized notion of a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. This postulation that we can do this, even when we're dealing with other kinds of Hamiltonians, does indeed seem to work. Incidentally, in this Schrodinger picture, we are implicitly assuming the time dependence of the system is described by the time dependence of the state, not of the operators. It does not matter fundamentally whether we put the time dependence into the states or the operators. When we evaluate the expectation value of the operator, we obtain identical results. The time dependent state picture is described as the Schrodinger representation, and the time dependent operator picture is described as the Heisenberg representation. I mention this point for completeness. The Heisenberg representation is used in quantum mechanics and is sometimes more convenient. And also because we did actually temporarily slip into that picture when we were quantizing the radiation field. At some points in the derivation we had p and q as quantities that depended on time, in which case if we turned them into operators they would technically be operators in the Heisenberg representation. Either one of these representations is valid Though if we stayed in the Heisenberg representation, we could not use the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and we would have to use a somewhat different but equivalent formalism. Here we will explicitly continue to operate in the Schrodinger picture, adding the time dependence to the states and choosing the operators, and especially the creation and annihilation operators, to be time-independent. With this approach to describing time dependence, 
As before, to get the time variation of a given state, we multiply our time independent energy eigenstates by this kind of factor here. This is e to the minus i times the energy times t over h bar. So for our specific state n lambda, with n lambda photons in our mode lambda, this is the eigenenergy, n lambda plus a half times h bar omega lambda. We can simplify that down by cancelling out the h bars, but the point is the same. So this is the factor we're going to use to multiply our eigenstate of the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which was our number state as we've been writing it. So we'll be able to make our original Schrodinger equation, the time-independent version, consistent with the time-dependent version as a result of including this factor in here together with our time-independent energy eigenstate. Thank you.